eggs files. And we're going to start with a solution to the matrix which has a little piece of a dragon and the egg story in it. This is the story of the Draco Queens, the dragons, and the origins of our civilization. What we're here to talk about today has to do with the cultural fascination with films like The Matrix and The Cube and The Prisoner, where there's this unconscious knowing that there's something holding us in some kind of a, a membrane. We might even think of it as a little bit of an eggshell. And it turns out that this metaphor of the dragon's egg goes very deep into understanding some things about our cultural origins. And in the process holds some very important clues to the origins of our language. One of the places where our fun little story begins about how do we see through the matrix? How do we get out of the prisoner? How do we escape the cube? How do we escape incubation? Actually starts a long, long time ago when perhaps there's a way of understanding that we began collectively, genetically, as the planting here of a dragon's egg. For this, I'd like to return to a moment in history referred to by Zachariah Sitchin and um, talked about in the comparison of the current vision of how people see the Draco Queens and the original Sumerian goddess statue. Right here, that's the Sumerian goddess statue. And that's a picture of the Draco as drawn at Montauk and at the firefight under Dulce. And we see that these apparent dragon queens are actually possibly what were called the Sumerian gods, which eventually became Inanna and Isis and maybe even Ninhursag. And so it is possible that literally there's something about their depositing here a dragon's egg that now needs to be penetrated with a kind of eye tooth for us to be collectively born that's contained in the myth of this waiting for the pearl here. Something in our gene pool creates the pearl that the dragons are waiting for. Dragons sometimes, for some reason, as we may see, are not that good of mothers sometimes, and their eggs are a bit leathery, and breaking through the shell is a little tricky. So if we look back and reinterpret the Sumerian uh, alphabet and story and tablets, as Zachariah Sitchin and Lawrence Gardner, in fact, have done, there is a rather strong implication that this, this group of what were called the Fallen Ones, or the Nephilim, uh, came here for an explicit reason to, for some reason, do some genetic engineering on this planet. And it may turn out that the story of the dragon's egg is the right one. Because if we look closely at theirs and others' interpretation of the Sumerian, it seems like what they did when they got here, the Anunnaki, which may have some relationship to the families from Alpha Draconis, or Draco, which is the shape of an Arabic letter L, and it's even ironic that uh, a major star in Draco is called Arrakis, which was the planet in Dune from which came the giant worms, or the dragon ones. But it appears that when the Anunnaki got here, one of the things they did to do the genetic engineering to make what apparently were gold mining slaves was they took the egg from the Anunnaki, the dragon queens, perhaps even Orion queens, if we believe that Thoth, son of Enki, came from Rigel in Orion, as we're told by this current Templar myth, that these Orion queens used Ninhursag's egg in which to plant the sperm of the Cro-Magnon man. And it was that experiment in uh, crossing over, Hivri, as in Hebrew, means the crossing over of bloodlines. Uru means serpent or dragon. So you had the Hiburu, the Niburu, the Nibulung, uh, being an experiment in the crossing over of bloodlines. And we were told rather clearly in the genetic engineering texts of Sumerian that Ninhursag's, Ninhursag's dragon's egg was, it's almost like they went to the place in the galaxy where there was this irritant, this, uh, this little impurity which triggers what you deposit to make a pearl. And the irritant apparently had to do with the fact that 
these Anunnaki had lost the ability for some reason to get their DNA, uh, we might say, ensouled or able to travel in time or able to have long-term memory or able to carry memory through death. Or another way of putting it rather humorously is after they lost the ability to squirt magnetism into compression inside DNA and through the speed of light into time, the only way they could travel in time was heavy metal craft, which was very embarrassing because everyone knows that if you travel in time using heavy metal, you're low end. So they were irritated because there was a threat to the immortality of their gene pool contained in this mythology of the fall, which I believe the word Nephilim means the fallen ones as Sitchin has interpreted it, in fact means specifically that the DNA stopped imploding. It stopped being braided to great spin density, which I believe has to do with what intense glandular emotion, passion, and bliss do by creating charge density to make DNA braid so that there's a wave inside a wave, super looping, it's called super looping, inside the DNA so you get this faster than light uh, squirt gun up the slingshot zipper up the slinky. And so here we have fallen DNA, an extended soul group family that for some reason lost track of their bliss and needed to deposit their dragon's egg to wait for the pearl. And now if we're right that that dragon eggs, dragon's egg, uh, Ninhursag's egg, Cro-Magnon sperm gave birth to basically Adam and Eve, uh, Tak Adama, Tak Adam, Tak means Orion, Adam means Borg, from which came Adam and Eve, Borg from Orion. These were the gold mining donkeys they were using and they used the gold not just as Sitchin said to repair the fabric of home atmosphere, but they were eating the gold powder. Now Gardner explains in great detail after Moses became confused about whether he was talking to Enki or Enlil, that is Adonai, Enki, or Yahweh, Enlil, Moses was confused, and he was acting out this Orion issue about the loss of the trigger of implosion in the blood, this immortality Gilgamesh sought. And so Moses became a gold powder chef, the white powder, the mana, the ormes, the spice in Dune. And this is talked about in uh, Gardner's book, Genesis of the Grail Kings. Uh, here is Moses suddenly needing to cook up a substitute for bliss implosion in the DNA. And it's all about gold powder. So the point is that it wasn't just that they wanted the gold to repair the electrical fabric around the planet, which allows by increased fractal recursion in the long wave magnetism of the planet, the stabilization of atmosphere. But in addition to that use for gold, they required the gold because they were eating it. And they were eating the gold because they needed a mechanical way to implode their DNA. Gold's valence structure creates implosion, the opposite of explosion, at the atomic level. And they needed this because they lost the gland juices. What was the form of the gland juices that they lost? And this is where we get this whole story of the astral milk house phenomena, this how you kind of milk a planet, which is classic among the dragon queens. They lost the ability to make their own glandular juices, so they need to eat other people's glandular juices, and that gives them the rush that they, they hunger for. And the seeds, the roots, the origin of this myth was contained in what was called, um, we call it royal jelly. And it means if you have a hive of bees and they need to make royal blood, they take royal jelly, which is the glandular best juices, and they feed it to special uh, eggs and that will make them a messiah, royal blood, a grail bloodline, a queen. And a similar uh, tradition existed among the Orion queens, if we are to believe the myth, as, as talked about also by Morning Sky in his book uh, Guardians of the Grail, in addition to uh, Gardner's scholarship around this in Genesis of the Grail Kings. What they used for their royal jelly was the oil of Messe, M-E-S-S-E-H, 
uh, which, from which comes our word Messiah, uh, one fed by the oil of Messe, which also means uh, the oil of the crocodile or the juice of the crocodile. And the juices of the crocodile were a key initiatory substance used in all the Egyptian initiations for relevant reasons. So what happened was apparently this became the uh, trained uh, temple uh, vestal uh, virgin menstrual blood of these trained uh, queens. And the menstrual blood under proper conditions of hygiene is very high in melatonin and serotonin. And this triggers um, early maturation of the pineal pituitary complex in the Messiah, the Kwasach, the Muabdib, the Avatar, who then gets a better squirt gun in the pineal pituitary and allows him to be the steerage through the speed of light into time of that soul group that needed royal blood. That's the real meaning of royal blood or the grail or uh, the golden fleece, the golden braid, perfect embedding in the DNA was that you get this uh, perfect implosion going in the blood and you get the ability to have this uh, like fire envelope, this cocoon of fire, this self-organizing fire that does not consume uh, the vril, the, uh, the perfect pearl uh, born out of the mouth of the serpent power. So this becomes in retrospect the trigger for massive uh, kundalini. And if we understand really what kundalini is at a glandular juice level, we see that uh, kundalini is the spine serpent brain able to pump out its reptilian mouth, which is called amygdala, which means almond or fractal or tower, to tower magdala. And out the mouth of the serpent literally comes this calcific excipient, it's called kundalingam, with first kundalini, which could look literally like a dragon's egg, you see? And what happens is this gathered juices of spinal ecstatic bliss, the result of sacrocranial pumping uh, massaged in envelope by the snake charmer of the heart's sonic sound at the moment of bliss. You have this snake charmer. And so out regurgitating out the mouth of the snake, which is the amygdala at the brain stem, comes these juices which trigger this massive squirt gun through the speed of light, which is how you massage the envelope to make an avatar. You make a, a leader, a primer of the pump through the, through, through the death wormhole, through the speed of light, into time. It's called the principle of lays are us. It was, the book is called The Lazarus Effect in the, in the Dune series. But what it really means is you train someone, as Jesus did Lazarus, how to squirt their memory coherently through compressed DNA fire enough to retain the spin pattern through the implosion wormhole through the speed of light so that when you come back, like trailing clouds of glory, you literally are able to draw through those threads through the speed of light the memories of what you saw. And that's called surviving death, the Lazarus effect, the lazing are us, the to laze and maze to create coherence in the DNA and create coherence in the glands. So there's a kind of a fun story told by a friend of ours. He's a great uh, sort of uh, naturopathic physician in Miami, uh, James Landrell. He wouldn't mind my saying. And he had this story that he had found uh, in, his, um, in his guides and his work with his inner shamanic activity that the Dracos appeared to be after him, so to speak, the Dragon Queens. And he couldn't figure out why. And... Um, Oh, it's kind of this fun story about he later realized they needed him to be somehow the negotiator because, see, this dragon culture had ruled a high percentage of the inhabitable planetoids in the Orion sector for millennia. And they ruled with essentially terror. And because these Dracos at the high end became our dragon bloodline, the dragons who are heroes in Gardner's book, Genesis of the Grail Kings, because they really are the origin of the blood of 
the royal families of France and Britain and Russia. You know, as he said, that's the meaning of Holy Blood, Holy Grail. That's the high side of the dragon blood. But the low side of the same dragon or Draco blood is the story of the firefights under Dulce. And the Dracos are 9 to 12 feet tall and they have two hearts and they're hard to kill. They're highly telepathic and they appear to be, in a sense, heartless. Uh, they, they can eat people. Uh, and they particularly like eating human glands that are full of fear because it gives them a rush. That's the fallen or low side. And our point is to not go at these stories saying, oh, now we've got to sort out the good guys from the bad guys. That's wrong. That's oversimplistic. What we need to do is the pogo trick of saying, we have met and encountered the enemy and it is us. What we're saying is, these are our ancestors, for better or for worse. The, the German, the Aryan, the Orion, the Orions, the Anunnaki, the Aryans have guilt for the war they made against the Nibiru, Hebrew, murdering them in mass. But the deep understanding of that guilt is they were murdering their mother. It was an, it was an Oedipus complex because the, the Nibiru arrive, the Hebrew priests, and they do the gene splicing, which is the mother of the Aryan bloodline. And why were they pissed at mom? Because dragons are terrible mothers. They don't do compassion well. Or another little fun piece of that story is why is the Elizabethan bloodline, Eliz Abeth, born from lizard, which is documented to be the Mog, Mogdalen, the Mogs were the, the Orion queens, the Mogdalen's blood. Uh, why was Elizabeth's bloodline, Queen Elizabeth, so lousy at mothering that all of, most of the members of the royal family have this quivering, stiff upper lip story, which is British, which means lack of mothering. And it, yet it's this firmness of this upper lip nose complex which makes the, the eye tooth of the dragon, which when it matures inside the egg, is what able, is able to, to peck its way through the dragon's egg. And that's how we get out of the matrix. So what we need to understand is how it evolves in our genetic material, in our bliss density, that we get the force to peck our way out of this membrane egg, which apparently is holding us in the matrix and the cube and the prisoner. It's like, first you're in flatland, but you don't know you're in flatland. First you're a prisoner, but you don't know you're in prison. First you're in the matrix, but the first step is to find out you're stuck in a matrix. You're stuck in a cube. You're incubating. Well, there's this fun little story. I'm going to show you one more little picture here on the computer screen. This is from the uh, black hole in the Bardo quest in Orion. Here is a picture of part of what would be called a hypercube. Okay. Now, a hypercube is literally the way out of three dimensions. It is the map out of Flatland. It is the way out of the cube. It is the way out of the matrix. Now, our friend Vincent Bridges, who was studying this language, which became the movie Stargate, which is called Enochian Ophanum. And he was studying the grid structure of this language. And these are the letters. Now, these actual letters became the glyphs used to make the movie Stargate, which is how you squirt live people's DNA magnetics through black holes and into time. And these letters, I believe actually, if we look here, became, if we look over here, here is the origins of Greek based on the Ophain and Enochian alphabet. And here is the origins of the Cherokee bird tribe language based on the same alphabet. And we were just looking today at this rune structure called, uh, what was it called? Uh, Elder Futark? Uh, the Elder Futark runes. And they all seem to have this thing in common about this ancient angel alphabet. Now, where this alphabet first came from is the story of John D. John D. was a scholar who apparently knew most of the languages of the planet Earth of his day. He was the teacher of Francis Bacon, whom I believe was the son of Queen Elizabeth, who under the pen name Shakespeare wrote Hamlet to find out from the look on her face whether she was his mother, uh, SirBacon.org, the scholarship. And uh, so John Dee, 
who became the founder of the highest leverage form of magic on the planet today, the, the um, Enochian physics, the order of the golden dawn, the Enochian calls this Ophanum language. And what happened was John Dee was given this egg by apparently an Ophanum angel who knocked on his window and said, you want to talk the language of the angel? Look in here. And John Dee looked in this egg, which is still in the British Museum today. It's a green stone. It's a, it's a kundalingam. It's an egg. It didn't see very much. But it turned out when you looked in there clairvoyantly, you saw this alphabet, which scholars have been studying for like X number of hundred years since, saying it's the most profound thing that hit Earth. And here we're seeing, when I showed this same alphabet to Dahani Wahoo, the high initiate teacher of the sacred Cherokee, she says, oh, that's the star language of the Adawi, the star elders of the Cherokee, whose mission apparently was shamanically to squirt soul groups, DNA groups, through wormholes into stars. And now, Vincent does this lovely analysis of this alphabet. Let's look again at the picture. And he says the gematria of how the letters are laid out. And he uses the Greek alphabet to interpret the number values. And he says the layout of this alphabet is a hypercube. He says, this alphabet is a map to how to squirt magnetism through a hypercube. This is Vincent Bridge's work. Now, another way of describing how you would add spin to a cube to make a hypercube is the model of five cubes in a dodecahedron, which if you look at it in uh, another shadowgram, you get this map of perfect implosion, the icosadodeca which is literally what you see when you superpose DNA, earth grid, and zodiac, that perfect nest. Uh, we have another partial picture over here in this zone tool model where we show some of the stellations. We'll take a peek here. This is this little zone tool crystal. You see that each of the connecting points is the Rambi Icasa, which is really the Icasa dodeca. And if you stellate these in every which way, you get this perfect nest of golden mean ratio of perfect three-dimensional fractality, which is implosion, which is the geometry of DNA, earth grid, and zodiac, was what was called Ezekiel's wheel, city of revelation, and may in fact be the only possible three-dimensional fractal. And the symmetry might actually be the symmetry of Gold's valence shells, and the true map to how to fuse anything. So it's like the symmetry operations in 3D necessary to squirt light into implosion. If, if we ask any good shaman, and I've asked a few recently, they all tell you that when you come to a black hole, uh, remember that sham on comes from shem on, which means shem, to raise the highward fire stone, which is really what the Tower of Babel was, the origins of the true unifying language which is simply the symmetry operations to climb the tower or the magdala or the jed, the raising the jed of symmetry. And so the Shem An was the one who knew to ra how to raise the highward firestone, which was literally to create a magnetic structure that could squirt genetic memory, the lucid dream, back up into the stars. Because otherwise you're stuck inside this egg whose membrane is the speed of light. Let me give you this other, this other lovely picture. This is a Templar manuscript we're going to look at now. And this is from, this is called the Kirkwall Scroll. Okay, I'm going to bring it up here. This is, the Templar tradition you'll recall was this discussion about the tantric bliss of Jesus and Magdalene creating a family line, a bloodline, a grail which became the royal families of Europe. In the tantric bliss of Jesus and Magdalene, the magnetic emanation of their hearts created a link up of the blue fire ultraviolet tantric bliss cocoon which carried their eye of perception on the wings of the inertia created through the speed of light of the tantric bliss eyeball through the pentagonal embedding of the heart of the sun into stars in this auric cocoon, which literally was, here is the faster than speed of light column up, the double helix of DNA, 
and it encounters the shock wave of the speed of light, which is called Ionic Doric and Corinthian Columns. And when the, when the DNA gets excited enough, and all the time travelers, whether it's Montauk, Damon Herr, or Incubate Cannabula said, sexual excitation was a key ingredient. Sexual excitation was a key ingredient for how you got the DNA excited enough to spit out enough ultraviolet to make this gorgeous, lovely little cocoon, which then you could use to go through the speed of light. And everybody knows that with good sex, you see stars. Well, the physics works. The fact is, Magdalene's tantric swoon, or when, when Jesus was no longer available, was the fact that she needed to rejoin the body of her lover in the stars. So here she tells the builders of the Gothic cathedral, Bernard of Clairvaux, sit, sit the Gothic cathedrals in a pentagonal star map of Virgo on the landscape so she can use that fractal in her magnetic backyard, her bloodline, her black Madonna children, as a lens to get their memories as a soul group back into the stars. This was called Et in Arcadia Ego, which became Joan of Arc and the Archons of the Anunnaki eventually became the American word Archonsaw, which is where Bill Clinton comes from, which supposedly he's the illegitimate son of the Rockefellers, uh, Winthrop, which supposedly lived on the fortune of the railroad cartel, which came from Daniel Pacer, which if we believe the, the book a Pandora's Box, was the wealth brought to uh, Tryon, North Carolina, after Louis the Sixteenth died in the French Revolution, and so the Magdalen bloodline in the French royal court becomes the Clinton Rockefeller bloodline, and you get this whole story about the uh, well, he ca calls it Pandora's box in Christopher's book. But you get this idea that the plot thickens. You know, they needed a place to create a haven for the possibility of the rebirth of the star family in the stars. And remember now, we're trying to get past this childish little uh, David Icke versus Lawrence Gardner controversy, which has to say, these are the good guys, and these are the bad guys, this is the white hats, and these are the black hats, and don't get them confused. It's richer than that. It isn't that David Icke or Lawrence Gardner are wrong, it's just that no one wants to do the dialectic which says, why did we need the juices of this powerful reptilian family, the dragon's egg, planted here in order to get the leverage we needed for the juices up the spine to make the eye tooth that penetrates the dragon's egg that gets us out of the matrix. The, dra the, the membrane of the egg is literally the speed limit of the speed of light, which sets a cocoon around all human activities. You can kind of say, from that perspective, the only thing that ever emerges from the planet is that which can be squeezed using DNA and glands bliss tight enough to go through the speed of light. It's the only thing that survives. Well, you say, well, why does this question arrive now? We've been doing fine for 2,000 years and Anna Hayes in the halls of Amenti says, it's not 2,000 years, it's 500 million years we've been being messed with by various ET bloodlines. Uh, but why does the question arise so urgently, so critically now? And this is where actually Jose Argoyas' Mayan calendar really comes in because the reason the question arrives, arises now is because the sun is about to burp. The Christians would say the rapture is here. And what they mean by that is the same thing the New Age people say with lousy astronomy that the photon cloud is here. What they mean is magnetic compression is here. And the sun does an appropriate test to see if we can squirt our DNA like a steering wheel into the sun. Because otherwise, the ET family knows that our gene pool is of no use to the stars. If you remember when millions of children sang at the same instant on the days of the Earth Healing events, the Earth Day events, and on two separate occasions, they measured a dramatic, rather sudden shift in the solar flare activities when millions of children sang at the same moment. 
what we were beginning to learn was not only is it necessary, but the sun wants us to steer the sun. What it is is, it starts like this. When you die, at the moment of death, the body loses 4 to 12 ounces. That is one measure of the amount of gravity stored inertia, our only measure of mass, uh, that's the amount of stored inertia that our conscious focus has been able to throw its weight around. So you put your attention little finger, your attention moved a charge, charge created embedding, embedding creates gravity, attention a little finger creates a tingle, you make presence by moving your attention. That's the force of your attention. It literally throws weight around. Well, hologram, a matter being merely a hologram with a weight problem, you have this situation now that only collective centering force, that same thing which steers tingle into your little finger when you put your attention there, collective centering force, fabricating gravity by squirting self-reference into the wormholes that hold little donuts inside bigger donuts, that focused self-reference, self-awareness, creation of centering force is what is the glue which is the mechanism of all real bonding, ionic, covalent, or human. Okay, And that fabrication, fabrication of centering force is what eventually, in the collective migration of soul groups, enables us to inhabit and steer through and use the sun like a lens. This is with a deep meaning behind the Maurice Cotterell's work, the Tutankhamun prophecies, about the geometry of the fire in the sun being the mechanism of all fertility in DNA, and the real center of the Mayan calendars, codons being the I Ching, uh, DNA codons based on the pattern of the fires at the heart of the sun, which looks like the slipknot Anu, same as the shape of the human heart and the ultimate subatomic particle, and the heart of hydrogen, whose spectral emission series is in fact Balmer series log functions of golden ratio. So you have this whole metaphor about the heart of the sun is the only slingshot out of here for the collective genetic squirt gun. It's called the migration of soul groups. So the halls of Amenti complex under the Giza plateau at Pyramid was um, a fabricated magnetic lens designed to allow whole soul groups to squirt themselves through the speed of light into time, to emerge from the matrix, to peck their way through the egg. Well, it turns out that the alignment of those sacred site structures has nutated and has shifted and has slipped. And there's kind of a funny story told that um, after so much interventionism on this planet, various galactic forms of government, uh, Anna Hayes calls it, the Guardian Alliance, uh, Alex Collier, Letters from Andromeda.com calls it the Andromedan Council, various groups. It's clear they do not approve of interventionism because indigenous gene pools do not create new information for the stars unless they're set free. So they can't and won't intervene unless we ask them to. But yet at the same time, Already we have been intervened with because interventionism is the origin of our DNA. So this uh, Guardian Alliance, uh, Galactic Federation, how you want it, various government bodies said, look, we are going to prevent this dangerous gene pool on Earth from being, uh, they called it a quarantine of a dangerous virus. That's us. And they said they let us out of the quarantine if we would... Um, uh, produce children whose emotions could bend stars. And the finish of the story about my friend who is the kind of, I could consider him kind of a Draco ghostbuster, uh, James Landrell was, he said, now the Draco high families realize that interventionalism, the astral milk house, uh, parasitism, an example of an astral milk house is, you know, Inanna goes to China and Mongolia after Enki and Enlil blow up the Sinai Peninsula in a nuclear squabble 
And that becomes the Mongolian blood, which becomes Ashkenazi, which becomes the Bank of England, which becomes the New World Order, that under the Templars creates insurance and banking. Bad press calls the same skull and bones navy, the pirates and extortion. And that is how you use banking and insurance and, you know, the financial mechanisms of a planet to milk a planet. You take that in combination with what may be 70 to 90 percent of religion on this planet is to create an astral milk house for low-grade ETs. You begin to understand that human gland juices, the auric, thick, sticky stuff of coherent emotion, is food for beings who can't make their own gland bliss. And it's like the St. Germain story is if you become addicted to the gold powder, you can make a technologically immortal astral body, but oops, you're stuck. You can't get beyond that astral body. So there you are wandering about the ether, some of these ascended master stories, and all you can do is set up astral milk houses, which unfortunately has a little bit to do with the Elizabeth Clare Prophet story, and all these astral milk houses because these quote unquote masters, Ashtar, for example, that whole lineage, can't get enough juice to go through the membrane due to speed of light. And so what do they do? They have to eat the, they create fear to make this lovely little juice they eat. So we have been teaching these principles that implosion, this raising of the Jed Tower, this creating of the body polis, the pole, the pol political, the polarizing of the magnetic field in the aura, or to make this implosive fire in the body, is the only thing that can really fabricate a membrane that can penetrate, can go through the speed of light. And for the same reason then that a vampire cannot be in sunlight, parasitism cannot happen in the presence of an imploding heart. The imploding heart begins the moment you feel the agony of separateness, which can only happen if you're allowed to feel separate, which cannot happen in a Borg telepathy. When you feel the agony of separateness, then you can choose to turn your electrical center self, your heart, inside out. In the beginning of that turning inside out ness, when it goes to completion, squirts a bigger worm inside a bigger worm inside a bigger worm right in the electrical field donuts which cause the heart to fire. And that electrical implosion of where the heart is fired in the fractal branching self-similar algorithm of the fibers of a kinjol where your heart catches electricity in the perfect scalar quote-unquote free energy device teaches us the real origin of fusion energy. If the heart's on fire, that is the mechanism which makes all immune systems. The thymus is the catcher's mitt for those sonics, uses the harmonic tinker toys to fabricate the immune system. The thymus does not shrink if there's bliss, and bliss fuses the implosion in the heart, and that fuses the harmonic series of the sonic ponytail of the EKG, which braids the DNA to the point of implosion, which gives the worm an eyeball to squirt through the speed of light into time. So all of these sort of happily ever after motifs about if you are following your bliss, then there will be fire in your eye, there will be a twinkling eyes lifestyle, you will be nourished by spin, there will be high frequencies in your membrane, so there will be resolution and therefore twinkle in your eyeball's membrane. And then you can answer the devil that says, I'm going to take your soul. And your answer can be, ah, I know who you are. You are the twinkle in my eye. And which is your way of saying, there is nothing that is not myself. I can inhabit and embed in everything. And in so doing, you become the magnetic field that can consume all perspectives. And that starts this squirt gun that happens at the moment of new compassion when stars quiver because the new gravity is born. And this starts the pump that creates the amygdalic serpent mouth juices that comes down the kundalini pathway and completes the eye tooth which evolves that makes the dragon able to peck its way through the egg, the membrane, the, the Niburu, Ninhursag's egg shell. And suddenly, 
we collectively are the bullet in the furnace. It, the story is that these angel families, call them Ophanim and Seraphim if you will, the angel families who ex initiated this experiment realized that new leverage genetically was needed on spin, on black holes, on starlight. A new way to squirt yourself into a black hole using the right tilt angles. The index to those tilt angles is the star alphabets, a superset of Hebrew. Hebrew is just the shadows of a tetrahedron. In a tetrahelix, you get no implosion in DNA. The Nibiru Hebrew priests could only make an uninsouled golem because they hadn't found the way to peck their way through the membrane. So they're stuck now. They deposited their dragon's egg here, Ninersog's egg, Cro-Magnon sperm. They stuck the egg here and then they had to stand back and wait for the pearl. The pearl was the fact that the Kundalingam, this calcific excipient that comes out the mouth of the dragon's brain, the amygdala, only happens when the bliss juice pumping goes to completion, which um, in sacrocranial pulse literature, Upledger is described as, well, if the sacrocranial pump is working, then you clinically cannot be depressed. So you have this mechanism of creating the harvest of spin of the ultraviolet blue fire sex juices, the tantra and kundalini of the body, into this serpent worm, which is the happily ever after, creating this possibility of the pearl. And the reason they needed the pearl was because their gene pool was going to be toast in the face of the sun's fire, the same way the way a vampire is toast in front of the sun's fire. And so they must stand back and wait for the discovery of this pearl. The mechanism of the pearl is the pure principle behind all religion, which is simply the pure principle of the hygiene that makes sharing and therefore bliss, because bliss is a name for charge so well shared that it converges. So religions were a name for the hygiene to make the bliss possible, which could converge the charge necessary, and that was the pure principle for how to create the solution to the dragon's egg to make the pearl. And that's, you know, I guess what they would say is, did you take the blue pill or did you take the red pill? That's the pill. That's the way out of the matrix. It's literally this. It is, here is the ultraviolet juices at your tailbone. You did the pelvic tilt. You switched your organ kunda buffer. You got the 32 degree tilt angle complement of the chin angle of the sphinx, tilting the cube into the dodecahedron, completing the implosion of the tetrahedral fire breath, and the long wave sonic up the spine completes this circuit of the juices where the dragon, the Scorpio, stings itself, eats the juices of its own tailbone, and that juice goes through us, comes out here, and you get this eyeball at the top of the worm which is like the picture of this uh, serpent uh, over the Buddha at the moment of enlightenment. And that's the eye tooth. That's, I'd give my eye tooth if we could understand that. That's an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Okay, That is the eye tooth which pecks the way through the egg and is the solution to the heart of the matrix. Thank you very much. And there's one other piece of this interesting little puzzle of the matrix that we should look at in parallel to the way out of the matrix, and that is the matrix established by the solar calendar. The example is the, the Mayan notion of the solar calendar, as Jose Argoyas has been describing it, where the centerpiece of that matrix of the pattern of the solar magnetics, the solar flare periodicities, creates this hexagram, 64 codons of the DNA in the I Ching. Well, the point of this matrix has to, do with, has to do with this notion that in order to inhabit time, 
we need to properly embed ourselves in the pattern of time. And this brings us to the subject of this little part of our conversation, which is called Just East of Eden, the Battle of the Brothers. And the Battle of the Brothers started actually back in the last section where we were talking about Enki and Enlil. Enki, as you recall, had later called himself Adonai, and Enlil called himself um, Yahweh. Enki's son, uh, Thoth, may have been identical with Hermes and Quetzalcoatl and Tutankhamun, if we are to believe Cotterell's scholarship in Tutankhamun prophecies. So, what we, the situation of the two brothers was that the Orion group had been ruling with terror this whole group of the inhabitable planetoids, and uh, so there was resentment on Sirius and Pleiades where the regent was named Ea or An. Ea, for whom Earth was named, became the father of, uh, of the Anunnaki, An's kids, Enki and Enlil. And Enki's son was Thoth, who purportedly was from Rigel in Orion. And so the regent Sirius, the regent from the Syrian sector, uh, planted the seeds of explosion and rebellion, the way out of the matrix here, purportedly by basically having tantric relations with Sara, Sarah, whose kids became Joseph and Benjamin, whose kids became Jesus and Magdalene, and you had Holy Blood, Holy Grail, which was the squirting in of high-level 11th dimensional Patal, the Pata DNA, which was bird tribe DNA, which had the potential to create the squirt gun out of here. The principle that became the, the flagship of the difference between Enki and Enlil was the issue of the calendar. And, well, there's lots of pieces of the puzzle. Enki and Enlil were of different mothers by the same father. And Enki was entitled, for some reason due to that mother ship, which I think has to do with Patal, to be taught by his father how to bring humans back from the dead, which he then used, whereas Enlil was not. And this became a subject of ultimately their understanding the principles of ensoulment and wormholes through the speed of light in general. So what happens was that Enki wanted the Takadama, the Borgs, the, the Golem, Adam and Eve, to be taught the true alphabet, the true psychokinetic symmetry operations to spin yourself through light speed, which is what alphabet is, to fold spin density property is to implode it, is to go through life, life, light speed, which is to say to symbolize is to embed. And so to get yourself embedded so you can screw yourself through light speed, you need to be able to enact fractally in your symbols and you need to be fractal in time as well as space. So the way Jose Argoyas depicts that, and I just enjoy this little picture on Jill Purse's book, The Mystic Spiral, but in Jose's work, he actually shows that event histories in time line up beautifully when arranged on a spiral. So you see that if you were to draw a line through the spirals to center each time, you'd create, you'd connect common events in history. And he's shown that time itself is spiral or fractal. There's a, a deep uh, mystery here if you want to sort of have a koan for the moment where uh, Plummer, the theosophic author in the book Mathematics of the Cosmic Mind, shows that the summated total of the angles of the nest of all the platonic solids called the lesser maze or the star mother or the Merkaba, the summated total of all the internal angles of the platonic solids in their nest equals the number of years in precession. What does that mean? Well, in the pyramid, if you look at symbols, their angular difference between each other is the amount of time between what they predict uh, in prophecy. And so it reflects back to the deep understanding that, in fact, relative spin is our only definition and measure of time. So angular measure is time measure. And when angular measure becomes recursive, the faster than light speed through time, if you went faster than speed of light, you could be here before we get here next year. That's how you go into time. The faster than light inhabiting of the wormholes of time 
becomes inhabitable. Another way to see that is, if event histories are not arranged spirally and fractal, then time and angels bleed. This is actually the Haophanim, the bird tribe, the Adawi, the uh, Valnapa, have bodies is because they inhabit, inhabit the fabric of time. And so when this childishness of the Montauk time travel uh, tears at the fabric of time, this, is, uh, uh, this needs to be repaired. Otherwise, there are these time implosions that destroy whole philo do patterns of soul groups inhabiting through history. So repairing the fabric of time was one of the great Templar agendas and continues to this day. So the lovely little squabble after Enki gets booted out of Egypt on, as, under the name Hermes, or I guess it was Thoth, Enki's son, gets booted out of uh, Egypt under the name Hermes for trying to teach a solar calendar because Enlil got pissed because that might make the kids psychokinetic and then the kids might be more powerful than their dragon parents. So Enki, uh, rather Thoth, goes to South America and changes his name to Quetzalcoatl and you have this whole serpent birdman thing, shtick, and teaches the solar calendar which became the Mayan calendric. Now you have Jose Argoyas, dear Pope, please retract your calendar, it is a mistake, right? <laughs> you know, which does get to a little bit of the higher matter that if the children cannot properly assemble themselves with respect to the periodicity of the fire of the sun, they will not then be able to inhabit the sun. It's not a matter of Mayan day keepers and counting the number of days backwards. That's almost trivial. It's okay. The issue is simple. Look at the pattern of the solar flare symmetries, how it is the map for all genetic fertility. Scholarship like Maurice Cotterell, whom I admire. And you use that map of solar fire and you inhabit the sun. And that's what this group, this family of solar shamans is beginning to teach us. There are women that see through the sun and they can steer us there if we will let them. You close your eyes, you do this soul group work, remembering the spin path back into your mother's egg. You then get a perfect common fractal point of reference, point of consumed perspective, maximum leverage by which advanced tetrahedral fire breath, the true Merkaba work, e pluribus unum, many can become one, and the whole soul group then can travel as a group and use their collective soul force, uh, attention force, as the arrow to the squirt gun, penetrating the egg, going through the sun. And as Yuri Geller measured, radioactive half-life decreases in the presence of focused human awareness. If you can't inhabit radiation, you can't inhabit the sun. Restoring the fractality of an atom is what eliminates radioactivity because fractality of charge is what created the gravity which is the fab fabric which holds an atom together. Self-reference, self-embedding creates gravity. Creating that force in focused collective human awareness is our possibility of being a slingshot through the sun. Inhabiting the sun's fire is the issue of rapture of our day and the only way our children will survive. So that's the story of the two brothers. And I was born, by the way, just east of Eden. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs>
wherein it was suggested that there's a certain point at which collective genetic evolution over thousands of years appears to itself as a wave come to have intent or ability to steer itself. And this would be uh, expanded upon as a concept if we take seriously this notion that when a harmonic cascade implodes, presumably by harmonics of the golden ratio, then that implosion is what makes the field effect begin to become self-steering. That's essentially how we manage chaos. On a very personal and somewhat intimate level, what this might mean is it is no longer enough just to sit back and say, oh, well, DNA made a left turn here a thousand years ago, and now the collective ge genetic material is making a right turn. Like, for example, we notice, oh, the fertility of male sperm has gone like, <coughs> and we say, mm, is that a decision the collective genetic material made, or is it a decision that we made to steer our own DNA? And that's ultimately one of the issues here that is being pointed to us by even the various star cultures who are whispering in our ear, as it were, is, the only way we get out of here is to take collective responsibility for the direction of our own genetic material, which is to say, to, to take over and steer for ourselves. And so that um, possibility that we might be responsible for the direction of the magnetic worm, the, 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 the lightning current up the DNA's zipper, as it were, that taking responsibility for the direction of that worm is what the new physics is teaching us about what bliss, what charge density, what spin density can do for DNA. So a kind of summary of where we've come so far is that, uh, yes, we are the world and we can steer and taking responsibility is possible because we now understand the pure principle. Another question that we were invited to address as we began here was someone asked, we did this little song and dance the other day, and someone says, well, what is spin? Because we're talking about spin density and charge density. Remember, we, we begin with this idea of a unified field, so that when the uh, religion, as it were, of Christ and Einstein says we are all one, what it essentially means is we're all made of this compressible jello. And to send waves through this compressible jello is the role of mind among waves to create the still points that eventually steer the waves in the jello. So the role of mind among waves is to create the still point which steers the waves. Now, if that's the case, then in a sense we never had anything but shape to describe. We couldn't name carbon and oxygen and say carbon and oxygen are made of different stuff because now we're learning that it's just a different way of braiding the same ether, the same light, the same jello. So the only thing we ever had the privilege of naming was shape itself. Now if that's true, let's relook at the question of what is spin. Spin is a description of the only thing that stores inertia among waves. So anytime a wave is going in a line, we call it energy, no stored inertia. That's the definition of mass, is storing inertia. So it's only when you begin to have spin that you store inertia and pattern, get mass, or create. So spin, in that sense, is what creates. That little conversation, it's sort of really quantum mechanics 101 for idiots, which is okay. We, we need a way to understand these things in very primal terms. But if that's true, we could go deeper into the metaphor and ask this kind of koan kind of question, why is it then that if spin is what creates, then since only love, since only love bends the light, only love creates, we can see now that when you create this long wave phi ratio, low phi, love, start the implosion in the heart. You start creating centering force that begins to suck in a little of that wave in the line into the circle. And so whatever created the gravity, the centering force, the substance of we feeling, is what sucked the wave from the line to the circle and therefore bent the light. And you see that since only what draws the light to begin going in a circle, store inertia, it's called quantum mechanics, that's the only thing that does create. So only embedding creates and only love embeds. So you get this idea that what we begin to learn 
as a glandular process to fold magnetism inside itself, inside our bodies, eventually allows us to practice that same pure principle as we bend the light when we inhabit things larger than bodies, like planets and stars. We were very parochial when we thought that only human bodies were inhabitable. What's ultimately inhabitable is any waveform that's recursive enough to be self-aware. So galaxies have spiral arms for the same reason that people do. <laughs> okay, well I wonder if that was a happily ever after of that part. So now we're going to investigate this question a little bit more about if we understand that it is indeed bliss that will get our DNA up to speed and create this ability to have starlight, let's talk about techniques for bliss and practices that involve bliss. And we'll divide these into several categories. Uh, one of them we will talk about will be um, what might be an extension of what's called posture-induced ecstasy. Uh, there's a book by that name by Felicitas Goodman, uh, in which the sequence of the posture of the body creates pressure on a certain sequence of glands so that if you pressurize and then depressurize the glands in the right cascade, you create a cookbook for bliss. This was also reflected in the what was called the sacred gymnastic of George Gurdjieff was an Armenian mystic, rather famous. Uh, the film was called Meetings with Remarkable Men. And there's some lovely scenes at the end where you see the sacred gymnastic of Gurdjieff and the uh, amount of focus it took to hold your wave center that... Uh, well, I think of it like Sister Mary Nunn says, approach the communion rail, little Johnny now, with the quality of grace. And what Sister Mary Nunn meant was hold the field effect with your attention in a wave cascade where the charge does not leave your body. Except she used the word grace instead of charge. But you see it meant the same thing. That attention is what keeps the wave aligned so when you move like, do you know what a second order derivative is? Is when you slow down in a quality where the rate at which you slow down is a continuous rate. And that, uh, this continuity within discontinuity, is what braids charge effects. And eventually we call that the Tai Chi, or the moving of the Dantian, where what you're doing is you catch and grab hold of more electricity with the centering force of more attention, more accurately focused. And then holding that electricity, you can move that charge around with your attention, the Dantian, right? Well, so throwing your weight around meant understanding this quality of grace, which is the quality of concressing capacitive waves non-destructively. Uh, visualize if you dropped a pebble into a river and the river was flowing this way, the waves that emerged from the pebble in the river would be closer together on one side and further apart on the other. And ultimately, we can understand the shock wave that is the speed of light based on this, our relationship to the wind of gravity going through our planet. Uh, so ultimately, steering the charge with respect to that wave is a matter of steering all of these waves of charge so that they all can nest to one point. And if you, if you crack the whip of your attention where you ride this long wave down into a short wave and then a shorter wave yet, in that approach to stillness, you can feel the charge that grows because you've done this exercise, which actually brings us to one of the exercises I wanted to describe. It's called the spin path to the zero point, and it's a breath exercise. And it's based on what's called the mathematics of perfect damping. Perfect damping is if you have a wave that's going up and down like this, and you want to stop it, but in such a way that you don't lose any inertia around the way. It, it wants to coast perfectly. That the spin path to the zero point would look like, it would look like the side view of a caduceus. And in fact, in the mathematics of perfect damping, the height of this wave with respect to the next one is golden ratio. And the length of this one with respect to the next smaller one is golden ratio, or 0.618. So if you visualize a caduceus, you know, the symbol of the medical profession, and you wanted to climb the ladder, you'd start with a very big breath. 
and then you take a smaller breath, which is about 0.618 as big, and then you take a smaller breath yet, and then a smaller one, and then a very refined breath. And as you breathe that way into the stillness, I can feel my hair standing up right now. I can feel a little charge bubble electrically around my body. I've become a fractal attractor. Well, that activity is the, produce, the, the process of producing a spin path to a zero point. It's just like in order to reach in and touch lightning and not burn your finger, you have to go in this contiguous pathway where you go from infinite motion to infinite stillness without at any point doing anything ungraceful. So that's one practical exercise. It's called the exercise of the spin path to the zero point. And you can do it in groups as well. Most of what I'm going to describe in the Twinkling Eyes lifestyle section here of this conversation is on the web summarized at the address danwinter.com slash health, H-E-A-L-T-H. And the top link there is the actual Twinkling Eyes Lifestyle article, and there's some links below to various other suggestions. So we're beginning to get the idea that if we understood the principle of what is life force, we would then understand the principle of how to eat spin. And really, in answer to the question we started with, what is spin, then? Spin is every wave that survives. And with that, let's take a little different point of view now. So a lot of the literature we have about the meaning of bliss energy and how we take bliss into the body has to do with the way in which touch becomes permissive or possible. So this story about the possibility of making touch permissive between people then becomes a good backdrop for the subsequent conversation about the spiritual nature of sexual energy, for example. So we're going to talk about the geometry of pressure in the perfect touch in this article, which is on the web at uh, danwinter.com slash touch. And I'm bringing up a mirror of it right now here. And the article is derived from the work of Dr. Manfred Kleins, who wrote the book uh, Centix, which is about this uh, waveform technology just bear with me just a second here. Here we have it, touch, danwinter.com slash touch. And the main picture that's of interest here is this one right here, which is about the waveforms that Dr. Manfred Kleins determined internationally were the way would people would touch in order to express different emotions. Now, he measured this in a very particular way. He used a little model of a, a finger on a button on a spring that um, if you if you put a button on a spring in front of a person and said now touch this button in such a way that you that you feel joy say and so you would touch the button on a spring and convey that emotion in the shape of the way you would touch the button the way the pressure would change over time if you passed a piece of paper behind the button as you touch it, you would make these little charts we're seeing down on the computer here now. So the axis along the bottom, the uh, x-axis, is the change in time, and the y-axis here is a change in the amount of pressure, where the increasing amount of pressure was when the wave went downward. So Here's the change in pressure over time with a touch that said joy internationally. And notice that the touch that says anger looks a little bit similar, but the moment of maximum pressure occurs a little bit sooner. So there's essentially three events in these centic waveforms for emotion. There's the beginning of the, uh, this, what I call the beginning of the squeeze, the end of the squeeze, and the point of maximum pressure, or the point of the maximum squeeze, as it were. So I analyzed what Manfred Kleins did and came up with this simple series of ratios 
where the touch that said joy is a touch that occurs one-sixth into the duration of the event. Whereas if you're squeezing somebody to say that you love them, the point of maximum pressure is much delayed or tantric or it waits until about 0.618 into the duration of the squeeze or hug that says love. So let's try to understand this in practical terms. Now first of all, he showed this happened around the world that he was experimenting with uh, the fact that when he touched his violin string, if he used rubato or uh, it gave shape to the fold of the way he would touch the violin string when he played his violin, that this would determine whether or not people would cry. And so he was very curious to look at how the change in touch over time, the change in pressure over time, would be how we expressed emotion. Remember that a change in geometry of pressure may be a way to describe, describe everything in the universe because everything is made of compressible jello. Or another way to think about that is that pressure or tension was Tesla's name for voltage. So you have this idea that if you could change pressure in the right cascade or sequence, you could create anything because you could blow the right soap bubbles or the donuts, which is how you create matter out of light. So braiding pressures properly is kind of like the glass bead game. You, you assemble these nests of pressures properly so the cascade works, and we call that emotion, which is really energy and motion between frequencies where the wind or cascade between low frequencies and high frequencies, for example, begins when the ratio is right. So that's why this analysis that I did where we saw this simple ratio that it may be that the love hug is characterized by a hug where classically you wait till about 0.618 through the duration of the hugging process before your hug pressure comes to a maximum. We did a very, uh, shall we say, tongue-in-cheek humorous uh, conversation about this at the web article danwinter.com slash touch where we described a professor, professor who realized that his wife was requiring him to become an expert in hugging and so he wanted to get the best academic advice on how to hug. <laughs> but you can see uh, actually the, the, little, uh, the little funny story we used was that um, supposing you had selected someone that you wanted to express love to you would say to your proposed experimental huggy, as it were, uh, um, here I'm going to administer this test hug. And you then squeeze them very carefully in this way so that the moment of maximum pressure doesn't happen so quickly. It's a very gradual process where you initiate pressure, pressure comes to a maximum two-thirds the way, 0.61, in the duration of the event, and then you release gently. So that what happens is the long wave and the short wave are divided at the golden mean cut. So they interfere with each other, such they produce another wave, which then interferes with the short wave, that produces another wave that interferes with the shorter wave yet, always constructively until a wave cascades or chirps or beats or heterodynes down the ladder of frequencies until, and this is the question you ask of them, did you feel a tingle in your DNA, <laughs> which is really about whether or not your hug cascaded between frequencies and reached the spin density of the genetic material from the long wave of pressure in your hug. So you see that this could even be a, uh, a beginning of a recipe for Tantra in that we begin to describe how true coherent emotion is what's called adiabatic process. Adiabatic means energy conserving. It means you don't waste energy when you don't need to. Uh, in chemistry, it means that no energy is wasted or leaks away. In magic, adiabatic has the same meaning. It means that you know how to be peaceful and just hold your presence. And so we're beginning to understand how, in fact, these touches which are the wave shapes of emotion, coherent emoting, coherent sending of energy in motion between frequencies. It's a cascade. It's a initiating of a scalar wave. Um, may in fact be a simple cookbook which you can practice with some exercises. One of those exercises that I would suggest after you begin to study this little bit about that emotion is a musical wave shape, which is a universal language, is that 
you could try sitting next to someone and doing a little experiment whereby the, their touch and your touch connect and you what happens is you touch hands and when you squeeze someone's hand or even squeeze their arm you can change the pressure over time in your squeeze and what you do by doing that is you decide what emotion you're going to send so if you said to your friend I'm going to squeeze your hand or your arm right now and I'm going to squeeze it three times and you tell me which three emotions I have sent to you and what you do is you modulate your pressure the touch that says joy is a touch where the moment of maximum pressure occurs one-sixth in the duration of the event and it has more of a release to it if you look at that picture at the article danwinter.com slash touch whereas the touch that says anger is a touch where the moment of maximum pressure is one-seventh into the duration of the event and it, it's, it has less release to it so there's uh, it, what it does is the touch that says anger by being a ratio of one over seven sends maximum destructive interference which is very useful as we say if you're shooing money, ta money changers out of a temple that you've actually created destructive interference whereas the touch that says love is a touch where the moment of maximum pressure is very much later into the duration of the squeezing process. So this is an exercise I suggest is that you actually practice touching in such a way that you people learn the alphabet of your emotions. So this ability to emote coherently is teachable and ultimately becomes how we fabricate our ecosystems electrically by shaping the magnetic fields that come from our body. So this is part of why our, our web presence is called Sacred Geometry and Coherent Emotion. Because coherence, magnetically, is how we use glandular magnetism to fabricate worlds. And as we've seen, even romantically, to bend stars. And this brings us to um, a conversation about the use of this touch energy to then move and store the ultraviolet of cellular metabolism which I call the biology of blue fire. This is going to lead us to an understanding about how the creative juices of the body, which is really the sexual energy, is gathered and moved and massaged by the way attention is moved. It helps us begin to understand how uh, even when we caress someone, we're moving, among other things, the ultraviolet, the charge envelope of gathered cellular uh, metabolism. So to understand what I call the biology of blue fire, which is really, in a way, the raw material of sex, juice, is a way to think about it, is to understand that the life of the living cell is a gathering of the long waves of food come into the cell and then metabolism is the a process or the process of massaging the cascade of the frequencies of the energy of that food from longer to shorter to shorter to very short wavelengths until ultimately it's high quality short wave ultraviolet light or blue fire UV which is the motor of meiosis and mitosis, uh, cell division, the arrows, the sex of cell metabolism. And see, one of the things we need to understand is that if you watch meiosis and mitosis, cell division in a microscope, you can see that it's a musical dance that you couldn't possibly describe it as enzyme A moves to enzyme B and that moves to enzyme C. No, you could only describe it as a choreography of a standing wave of music as it would fold on the surface of a liquid. And the geometry of the music that chore choreographs the position, for example, the alignments of the microtubules, is ultraviolet. It's UV. It's the blue fire. And so harnessing this ultraviolet or blue fire or sex juice of the cell is the determination of the timing of cell replication. That's, that's why it's the key to cancer, for example. Cancer will never really be well understood until we model the field effect of what triggers the onset of replication. In fact, 
we could very usefully model the onset of cancer versus a healthy cell. Well, first of all, as described in my article uh, at danwinter.com slash cancer, frequently the healthy cell is an egg-shaped where the length to the width ratio is close to golden ratio, whereas a cancer cell is frequently much more spherical. And therefore, the cancer cell is not as able to pass frequencies between harmonics through touch. The reason is because the cascade of harmonics on an egg where the length to width ratio is golden ratio is a vector that sends spin off the surface of the skin of the soap bubble. And that means that the golden ratio shaped egg in a cell uh, configuration would be touch permissive. Whereas a spherical cell would tend to hold all the inertia in the spin that it finds itself. This is helpful to understand the true medical definition of cancer, which is what's called contact inhibition. In other words, if touch does not inhibit replication, that is the definition of cancer. Well, ultimately, permission to touch is this ability to create a path for the ultraviolet to leave the cell. And the ultraviolet, the blue fire, the sex juice, can't leave the cell unless there's a harmonic cascade between membranes called wet-making power, which is how Faber d'Olivet translated the word Eve, as in Adam and Eve, Eva, to make wet, or to make word, or to give permission to touch by arranging for the symmetry on the surface of donuts or soap bubbles wet-making power. And in fact, surfactants can be very profound, that is, uh, surface tension reduction, like lecithin or detergent kind of actions, can be very interesting therapies for certain kinds of cancers. For exactly that reason that the path out of the cell for the blue fire sex juice means that only if the ultraviolet is stuck inside the cell with no place else to go, does it become promiscuous. That is, have kids too soon. That is, divide prematurely. For exactly the same reason that a young girl or young boy, given lots of creative outlets, guitar playing and dances and lots of creative things to do, doesn't have to become promiscuous and have get fixated on sex at too early an age and not have a more uh, refined uh, channeling of the creative juices up the spine to other creative processes. Whereas a young person that's not given all these wonderful creative outlets becomes promiscuous because there's nothing else to do with the ultraviolet blue fire sex juice. So here we're seeing that this wave mechanical understanding of the bliss juice of the living cell not only helps us understand cancer, but begins to give us a language to talk about the spiritual use of sexual energy, which is part of the main subject of this next part of our little conversation. The blissful urge to touch between people, which is really behind sexual energy, can have very, very useful and profound spiritual import or power. At a very fundamental level, when this ultraviolet creative juice is gathered from cellular metabolism, some of the things that affection and touch and even foreplay can do is to to assemble this field effect of coherent ultraviolet in a bubble which is wave guided by the long wave of attention and touch and foreplay and the sounds of the heart, for example. And ultimately, uh, in the description of uh, spiritual sexuality, uh, we will be talking about Tantra and Kundalini. And for that, we will have a simple model to understand how this gathered ultraviolet creative field effect or uh, sex juice or blue fire uh, proceeds up the spine. And I often call this uh, the plumbing 101 for bliss. And uh, it's helpful to understand how the tailbone works to act as the switch for this straw. In um, In Gurdjieff, there is this description of what he calls the organ kunda buffer, which he said is an organ near the tailbone that acts as the switch for whether or not the juice goes up the spine. 
And ironically, or interestingly, in Tai Chi, um, there is this concept of the pelvic tilt, which is used to release the angle of the tailbone, so it's almost like the curvature of the lower tailbone is unpacked just a little bit. And one of the results of this process is that the tailbone has the possibility of an opening in the end that functions like a straw or a tube. But initially it takes some hydrodynamic pressure to break that open in some people. And also there's another uh, aspect of the tailbone which is what I call vestigial horse hairs, which it was b basically the hairs around our original tail when we were monkeys. And those hairs have a, uh, a, an ultraviolet and a microwave conductive quality. They're waveguides. So together, for example, in the male, they can wrap themselves around the prostate. Uh, speaking of permission to touch, here's Kitty. <laughs> we must be uh, doing it right here, huh? So the tailbone becomes the place where the harmonics of the spine juice begin to pump. Oh, the kitty seems to tr see. The kitty was drawn to exactly where this ultraviolet is being gathered. She's touching my tailbone with with her tail right now. <laughs> it's interesting. And uh, Seth used to say that the kitties were astral antennas, right? Well, the reason that kitty is attracted to that charge is the same way that people are. Is because any place we gather that ultraviolet blue fire juice is a place where biology knows that information is about to change hands. It's like the modem is about to be hooked up. So anyway, what happens is then, once, instead of going downward in conventional orgasm, the creative juices begin to be pumped upwards. And the, uh, the long wave sound of the heart harmonics become a peristalsic pump which is just like the cilial hairs of the intestines sweeping along the food, the long wave sounds are the snake charmer, which is the pump for the spine juice. This is called a sacrocranial pulse, and I believe Bentoff documented in Stalking the Wild Pendulum the way in which the heart sounds phase locked the liquids of the ventricles of the brain, which are made of the same stuff as the spine juice, so the spine juice pumping the long waves in the spine, which Upledger at the Upledger Institute in Florida showed, were such that if the spine liquids were pumping, and this is a longer wave, slower than the pulse, but phase related to the heart, pumped by but different than, then it was clinically impossible to be depressed. Essentially, it means that the nature of what arrives at the dripping nectar of sweetness on the back of the tongue, nature's sort of pr a primordial reward for entering into bliss, is that the brain is nourished by the highest frequency gathered cellular emissions, the UV, the blue fire. So you touch, taste this sweetness. It's also true that in the male, for example, you can have a clear prostatic emission, thick uh, but clear out the penis where the haploid uh, white sperm cells have gone up the spine. And in the female there are, for example, descriptions of virgin birth, which are a very deep meaning because it is indeed charge that splits the egg. And this will begin to bring us to some interesting pictures which we will take a break and look at. So in order to understand how it is that it is in fact charged that splits the egg, we look at this place where the sperm arrives at the skin of the egg in human, at the moment of human conception. And we see that what actually happens among other things when described electrically is that the sperm delivers a charge wave that causes the egg to start a little tornado where it begins to dimple right here. It starts to look like an apple. And that little tornado, if the dimple goes all the way through the egg, turns it into a donut, and that's what starts the turning inside out process, which precipitates then the cell division, where you have this 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13 Fibonacci progression of number of cells, but it all starts with the turning inside out, where the ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm change places, and that's the first move you ever made. First move you ever made. We might say from kind of a poetic perspective, if if it is indeed this adiabatic or self-conserving of charge 
which really dimples the egg, then we might conclude that not only does technology need to go from explosion to implosion, but so does our practice of sexuality. <laughs> it's this turning inside out, which actually is the constructive moment. There's a, a great deal of spiritual significance to that charge split of the egg in terms of how Tantra then makes possible this relationship with essentially um, beings who have a higher voltage genetic material. You could think of Gabriel and the, and the, uh, and the Immaculate Conception of Mary and all those stories are actually stories of the skill to hold tantrically this charge envelope. Uh, tantra essentially means the ability to hold this blue fire in a field effect which then grows like an ultraviolet cocoon around the aura. Even as in the movie Cocoon, when he saw the high power of this gathering, cocooning of creative energies, he said, well, if this is foreplay, we're in trouble. I want to show you in this connection a couple more pictures here about how the growth path of the fetus then follows this particular pathway um, that the unfolding path of the fetus then again follows this golden mean spiral of philotactic perfect unpacking. And so even you have this heart within heart on the, on the body of the fetus. And then another series of pictures here has to do with understanding how the same projective uh, emotion path among the glands actually feeds the surface of a soap bubble. So we're, remember we were talking about how the angle at which you could make dents or a dimple on the soap bubble membrane of the egg was actually the origin of the alphabet in that it was a measure of the tilt angles of the donut which could store spin on the surface of a bubble. So keeping a soap bubble alive is a matter of wetting your finger and knowing the tilt angle at which to add spin to it. So understanding the way in which emotions send spin onto cell membranes is helpful to understand how bliss, sexual energy and bliss and bliss process in general create an immune system, create an immune system by storing spin on the membrane. So the way we draw it is that the harmonic cascade of coherent emotion feeds the cell membrane added foldedness. It needs the membrane. And the harmonic of the cell membrane, the harmonic content or frequency signature, is a lock. And the harmonic content of the virus is a key. And the immune system is whether the harmonics of the virus fit the harmonics of the membrane, whether the virus can embed or nest itself on the membrane to screw itself in. So very complete frequency harmonics, that is very inclusive experience of all possible emotions, great bliss density, create good cell membrane or soap bubble skins, and so AIDS did not happen in Africa until they stopped the bliss dancing, is the metaphor. And here we see a little picture of the difference between uh, coherence in a meditator and lack of coherence. That if we look at this chart, and I'm going to scroll to the left here just a little bit so we can see it better, see how these columns of brainwave coherence are associated with the moments of intentional relaxation where the health benefits of, in this case, transcendental meditation, but any form of meditation, are related to the coherence that onsets, which is related to bliss. And this becomes what's called bioacoustic habitat theory, where coherent harmonics create the self-not-self -self membrane of a healthy forest. One species dies, the forest finds another species to fill the spectral niche, or signature sound works. It's braiding theory, harmonic cascade in the mind mirror, when the harmonic cascade of the healer and the healed create the same frequencies in the brain waves as we measured in the heart, then you get this maximum energy transference, which we're seeing with the heart link is a way to use biofeedback for marriage counseling, for group process, even for tantra, for, for tantra, for embedding. So this is the picture I wanted to get to here also on the screen, where we're going to show this cascade of when people line up their glandular harmonics they actually create a cascade where coherent human emotion is squirted into or feeds the land. This is what Gurdjieff meant by coherent emotion feeds the earth. This is how the aboriginals sent their feeling, their substance of we feeling, down the song lines. And that added centering force you add to the wormholes 
add added centering force, causing the wormhole, the little worm, to nest better centered inside the bigger worm. That's the focus function of when we send feeling down a song line, down a wormhole. We add the glue, which is the phase lock of the centering force, which is ultimately what creates bonding. So whether you have ionic or covalent bonding, short neighbors versus long neighbor bonding, the issue is always phase locking. Phase locking is alignment. Alignment is what's provided by the implosion of electrical focus that we call consciousness. So essentially consciousness adds the glue to the wormholes by creating the centering force. It's what makes the gravity. So how does that relate to the spiritual function of sexual energy and Tantra? Well, that's where it gets juicy. You see, once human electrical energy has been focused enough to make this cocoon, whether it's with one person in Kundalini or two persons in Tantra, this ultraviolet electrical cocoon, uh, in the presence of extreme sexual excitation, but in the absence of conventional orgasm, begins to feed and grow itself and ultimately becomes faster than the speed of light. Uh, We could discuss this story in the kind of romantic context of what's called Magdalene's Tantric Swoon. This was described in the hard-to-get book The Magdalene Mystery by Kent, but there's some allusion to the concept in uh, the other books on Magdalene, including I Remember Union and The Woman with the Alabaster Jar. Also, the book by Jesse Ayani, Codes of Light, about the Magdalene bloodline. At any rate, the point is that Magdalene's tantric swoon was essentially that as a trained, uh, we could say, uh, uh, trained in the arts of Tantra in, in her extended family with the Essenes, uh, uh, she was able to know the disciplines of how to hold this extreme charge that came with sexual bliss without conventional orgasm. You get this pumping of the ultraviolet in a cocooning effect. This was also described in uh, the Incunabula papers. Uh, You can find the Incunabula uh, description at um, the site map at danwinter.com. Basically, it was a series of time travel experiments that explicitly depended upon sexual excitation. Uh, And you could think of Incunabula as being incubus where incubus is a self-imploding light cocoon, whereas succubus is one that's more parasitic. And in either case, the geometry of the self-feeding implosion creates a squirt gun through the speed of light. And if you can focus your inner eye as you see this, as any good cartoonist would know, good sex requires seeing stars. (laughs) And uh, in fact, that is truly what happens, that you begin to create a vehicle of light that allows you to penetrate through the speed of light and eventually uh, use the gravity center of the earth and then the gravity center of the sun as a series of slingshots for your attention. So this is ultimately how we will tell our grandchildren how we, uh, how we become stars when we grow up. <laughs> And as we get deeper, as we get ourselves more immersed in the discussion about Tantra and bliss energy, we'll discuss this relationship of the male to the female uh, in terms of the difference in the processing of the juices. The uh, essential difference is that the electrical uh, process which makes an egg has a lot more of the Uh, fractal unpacking quality, whereas clearly the process of making a seed at any plant level is very much a yang, a converging, a packing activity. And electrically that has a lot to do with the difference between the the male and the female sex juices, whereas it is frequently discussed that in the female there is literally a liquid ejaculant, whereas um, it's perhaps not as noted as in the male. But the fact is that Um, even in the classical 
instructions of how you do this 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 Merkaba, this uh, tetrahedral fire breath meditation in um, sacred geometry, even from Jerusalem as well as the Flower of Life, that the perfect way to approach this Merkaba meditation was to visualize the spin path into your mother's egg as a sequence of turns of the key turning points emotionally between now and when you were in your mother's egg because that will steer you back in the spin path to the center of the tornado because your mother's egg was present in her mother which was fully formed in her mother etc so that it's so fractal that it would lead you back to the dimpling of the big bang and it would give you a common point of reference with all others who were trying then at that same moment to access their center of ground, center of mothering, center of egg ness, center of perfect fractality. So that would be a little bit of a clue to how you get a common point of reference based on how fractal is the egg, whereas uh, um, the seed, for example, is an experiment in a, experiment in departing from embedding. It's like experimenting with how separate it can make. So the male often can experiment with um, separateness with a lot more agony than a female. And uh, so a, a male will often go out on a limb in terms of ideas, whereas a female is much more likely to be grounded in the land and embedded. And so ultimately, in, a sense, in the sense of immortality, the egg is already immortal. Uh, because it's already fractal, whereas the seed is totally at risk. And unless it founds a, finds a perfectly fractal egg, uh, the seed knows that its genetic material is essentially toast. And uh, that is expressed in very interesting ways in, um, in the way tantric process toward bliss is different between the male and the female. That I have known uh, women, for example, who can... Uh, feel very electrically orgasmic, just sitting on the earth and feeling their glands touching the earth. Or um, it is another way to understand this. Here's a good example. The uh, taboo against allowing women to bleed menstrually in a sweat lodge um, because the woman's menstrual blood uh, leaks this fractality and creates such an electrically lightning path into ground that the, sh the male shaman could not help but be sucked in. Whereas the uh, kind of the, I, I call it the Orion Queen energy working friends of Barbara Marciniak travel to these uh, dragon, uh, Draco sacred sites, even the Dome of the Rock, and they pour menstrual blood, uh, which is a lot more electrically the claiming of one space, then for a male it would be to urinate on the corners of the kingdom because the electrical nature of the grounding of the menstrual blood is so um, so embedding that it allows one to inhabit the space magnetically. So as, uh, as we were discussing in the intermission here, what have we learned about the approach to Tantra? Well, Let's try to translate in this, this into practical, juicy, and appropriate uh, ways to increase the sexual voltage. The fact is, first of all, the DNA knows when there's a bliss potential. So the first instructions to true Tantra is to listen to your inner voice, listen to your DNA when it tingles to understand that that's where the attraction lies because that's where the voltage of conjugation could be maximized. That's where you get this phase conjugate optics because two opposing laser beams annihilate each other. Uh, or in uh, Bennett's book in the Gurdjieff tradition on sexuality that, um, that if the partners are not of equal and opposite voltage, that one experiences a short and the other experiences a ground and unconsciously they will sabotage the relationship. So the only thing that works is if the voltage, if the tension, if the fire of the opposing uh, couple is equal, which is why it's such a miracle to find someone that really sort of is the perfect balance, because in that perfect balance, only in the spark gap that's perfectly electrical balanced can the square wave then stand still, and in the square wave of the perfect spark gap is a container or grail cup or chalice that in that moment of stillness can catch as many waves capacitively of all the different stars at once. 
So it's, it's how you incarnate avatar because the star waves of charge is the body of, of star beings or angels. Another excellent way to visualize this is to understand why eagles copulate in zero G. Uh, I think this was a Victor Schauberger story, but if you look at the arc angle of eagles approaching in the ritual dance of uh, a cell replica of, of copulation for eagles, they approach from opposite directions and they enter this perfect sculpted sort of elements of the spiral on a vortex spin path till they touch and then they grab talons and they spin in a perfect double helix in zero G for the moment of copulation. And the result of that is the eagle's eye contains the maximum horizon of vision, which is the maximum focus, which is the maximum alignment, aligning of waves in the entire food chain. So to be consumed in perspective, one needs to reach that still point in that perfect spiral spin path to the zero point. Um, I guess the, the romance, as it were, is that we're given enough voltage in our DNA to squirt ourselves into stars generally only if we see it in the mirror of relationship. And in relationship to others, um, we yearn for this place where the spark gap of, of, of conjugal relations, you know, phase conjugation, creates this perfect chalice or container or grail cup within which can incarnate the body of stars. Uh, bodiness is how long the wave that can be caught in the cup. So in that still point, moment of perfect Tantra, there is that uh, moment when you can feel the stars as if they're your own body. And this was what was meant by Magdalene's tantric swoon. So in this spin path of the way in which charge inhabits the body, we want to finish with a little description about how to apply this in hygiene and lifestyle in general. Um, and I'd like to use the example about how to eat spin, which is really the theme of the story, from how you, when you take a bite out of a whole apple, you feel a tingle in your cheek. You feel a kind of, a, you know, there's a little splash in that moment of charge. whereas if you took that, <laughs> hi kitty, if you took that whole apple and you cut it up using a knife uh, and then you ate the tiny little pieces, you don't feel nearly as much tingle. So this helps us to understand what you lose when you chop food up. What you lose is essentially what we call fractionation versus fractality. So what the tingle was in the whole apple was the long wave. Electrically, it was because the apple had consumed the charge of the earth it grew in, and the charge was a wave within a wave within a wave within a wave, and the spin was the food. Well, in, <laughs> hi there. In the West, what we do is we uh, chop up our grains, which is to say fractionate them, uh, and then we think of our, our world as particles. Whereas in the East, they eat their grains, they eat their grains whole which is to say they eat the long wave and they think of their world as one. And so it helps us to understand that the process of chopping up our food too much, fractionating the memory in the food, has actually cost us context richness. It has cost us embedding. It's cost us the way to occupy or inhabit the long wave. In the Surfers of the Sevilla by Jose Argoyas, he says, ride the long wave, Uncle Joe. And what he means by that, literally, is that if you can't feel and eat the long wave in your food and in your plants and in your earth, then you won't be able to feel the larger being bodies that inhabit the world around us. And so you're then condem condemned to separateness and fractionation. What we'd like to suggest, first of all, is A, that in terms of hygiene and practice then, it's critical to be able to feel a magnetic field. You literally need to be able to feel magnetism with your hands. You can do it with dousing and pendulums, that's fine, but eventually you refine that skill until you do it with yourself. 
And the ultimate other thing that you need to be able to do is when you walk into a grocery store and you make choices, you need to be able to feel what life force is because that's the food. And life force, we understand it electrically now, it's charge embedding. And life force is lost every time the food touches something metal, every time it's chopped up some more, every time its DNA is fractionated. Whereas when the food comes fresh from the earth, full of that charge embedding of a living, life bubbling organic field, then there's life force in the food. And that feeds the long wave in your body, which makes for good sex. It also makes for good spirituality. Same thing, you come to the spirit as you would to a lover. Some other practical things that in terms of the suggested exercises here is that once you're able to feel a magnetic field, you, you make a map of your bed, you make a magnetic map of your house, and you make a magnetic map of your backyard. And once you begin to get the idea of where the magnetic lines look like beautiful rose petals, there beautiful things grow, people and flowers. Whereas the magnetic lines are dizzy, then the people are dizzy and so are the plants. Some ways to do this include if you install a labyrinth or a stone circle where you braid the magnetism. The labyrinth, for example, you can read about this at danwinter.com slash labyrinth, L-A-B-Y-R-I-N-T-H. But the labyrinth is simply the shadow of the seven color donut on the land where it's this turning inside out ness and it creates this dimpling force. And where there is the ability to dimple, there is the ability to begin sorting magnetic lines. So let's look at a picture. So the labyrinth is essentially oriented magnetically. This is an exercise in how to make sacred space in your backyard. The mouth of the labyrinth, north, south, east, or west, will determine its quality, what magnetism it's attracting. And it's a way of creating sacred space by actively using paramagnetic stones, carefully chosen, to create that folding, which creates the dimpling force. And if we look, really what's happening there is the labyrinth is a two-dimensional or planar flatland projection of the seven spins on the surface of the seven-color donut Mobius. So it's really a magnetic donut learning how to create that dimpling relationship of the penis to the vagina in that sense. And if we zoom down here, we see that the one-dimensional turning inside out, which is right at the beginning there, the Greek key. Do you see the Greek key there? If you evolve the Greek key, you have in two dimensions the planar labyrinth, which is simply the sequence of turns you'd make to turn inside out on flat land. So when you reach the center of the labyrinth, even if you're riding a horse on a horse labyrinth, you create a common center of gravity turn inside out point by which man and horse become one. And in the same process, uh, man and the earth can become one by entering the dimpling point. So that's another example of creating sacred space on your land, whether it's a stone circle, whether it's using paramagnetic stones or dolmens. It's to get the idea that structures in the earth, like limestone, unlike sandstone, sandstone will fractionate the magnetism, but paramagnetic uh, structures like limestone will be a lens for magnetic field. So you make pretty pictures out of the magnetism on your land, and then you inhabit that field. It's a kind of a case of prepare the field and she will come. <laughs> but it's really more like if you have intense bliss, uh, Kundalini for example, you will ultimately not be able to be sane to support that spin density unless you inhabit a landscape where when you look out in your backyard, that too is fractal. And the other thing of course is that you do that in places in time which are also fractal. That's the meaning of the solar calendar and the Tutankhamun prophecies and the Mayan calendar. It's all a map of how to embed yourself in the solar patterns because we need to be fractal in time as well as fractal in space. And speaking of which, we're almost out of time on this section of our presentation, but we wanted to summarize at least by saying while we didn't go into all the details here, there's a lot at the article on the Twinkling Eyes Lifestyle, again, uh, danwinter.com slash health, but the principles behind this, that once you learn that it is spin density that's the same as awareness density, you'll never look at a table of food or a house in the same way again. Because even when you look at a table of food, you look for life force. 
Now when you look at a house, like this beautiful one we've been playing at for the last few days, it's paramagnetic stone, there's ceramic, there's clay, and there's a minimum of metal. Because metal shorts out magnetic lines, particularly heavy metals, whereas the ancient paramagnetic structures were always, like temples, were always paramagnetic stone and, um, and glass and things that would uh, create sacred space by embedding magnetism. So these are all things that we need to learn to do in order to make bliss possible in our lives. My suggestion is that, in fact, religion, when you sort of eliminate the personality worship, is the pure principle of the hygiene to permit bliss. And I further believe strongly, as we said throughout here, that we could reprioritize even political governments on our planet to recognize that if the only way genetic material survives is to embed itself ultimately into stars and bliss, the way that charge density gets DNA up to speed is the way genetic memory survives, then truly, from an absolutely logical perspective, bliss is the function of DNA and therefore should be the function of governments. That governments that teach that bliss is the priority would serve different food at McDonald's. They would teach the children bliss process. They would show that land building and house building and where you place a highway would always check to see if the sacred magnetism through the land was going to survive because the magnetic field and the bliss field are one. So we hope that this has been fun for you and uh, would like to suggest that this is only the beginning, that once you take this pure principle of fractality and embedding and charge density and inhabiting spin to heart, that you learn that you could actively make choices to make more bliss po possible in your daily life. And it starts with relaxing because when you relax, you embed in a longer wave. So let's relax together now as we say goodbye and enter the spin together. Have a great day. Thanks for joining us. Bye.